Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on college admissions. This is another one of our series in the changing landscape of college admissions. And today, we're very honored to have as our guest here at Guided Path, Peter Van Buskirk. And Peter is a professional, he's an author, he's a speaker, he's the former Dean of Director um, at Franklin Marshall College, and I've known him for many years. He's a great motivator and a great advocate for students and parents. Welcome, Peter. Thank you very much, Cindy. It's great to be part of your program. So, at Guided Path, we offer these free webinars to give you information as professionals that you can share, or as parents and students that you can um, learn and grow from as well. And we will record this, and we will make the slides available so that you can spend this time today just listening and absorbing all the information. But these will be available look for an email that has a link to our blog that'll have the PowerPoint and the presentation recorded. So watch for those. Also, if you'll find at the bottom of your screen, there is a place where it says question and answers. We will be taking questions, or Peter will be taking questions at the end of this webinar. Um, you can use this place to record things as you think about them, and if something's going awry, um, you know, please let us know through the question and answer section. I also have with us Andrea Lindquist, who is our technology support, and she makes all this magic happen. So glad you're here, Andrea. And Peter, I'm going to turn the time over to to you and have you share with us about the down and dirty on the college admissions process. So thanks for right. being here today. Well, when Cindy asked me to talk about uh, the current admission landscape and uh, have we found the, the curse or the cure, uh, it occurred to me that I'm not sure we have a real answer on that. But the, the presentation I'd like to share with you today, the down and the dirty about the college admission process, is predicated on the notion that a lot's changed about college admission. Um, for many of us uh, who went through the process uh, a generation ago, uh, it was a far simpler time. And uh, you, you applied, you got in, you went. Well, now we all know that, that it's a much different process, much more competitive, much more uh, commercialized process. And one of the things that, that uh, bothers me as I observe the goings on in the current day process is that there's very little transparency um, and uh, families are, are still kind of left in the dark or even more so left in the dark about what, what's going on in this process. So what I'd like to do with you today is share with you some thoughts about how we can kind of parse all of this out and understand the down and the dirty about what's really going on in the college admission process. So I'm going to start by taking a look at the, uh, uh, the competition here. Um, many of you who have seen me present before know about the pyramid of selectivity. The pyramid of selectivity is a concept that I developed years ago when, when it became clear that every audience of students has a range of aspirants. Some students want to go to very selective schools, some not so selective schools, yet we all must talk. So if you can imagine putting all the colleges in the country on this pyramid, not according to how good they are, but according to how hard it might be to get in, um, we can answer a lot of questions the students have that sound like, well, how important is? How important is my academic record? How important is my testing record? How important is you fill in the blank? Well, as you look at this pyramid, uh, the, the, you can organize all these schools according to selectivity. The further up the pyramid you go, the fewer schools there are and the harder it is to get in them. Near the top, they might admit one out of eight. You come down a little bit more, more schools admit a quarter, even more admit roughly half. Most schools are relatively open in the process, admitting more than half the students who apply. And as many of you know, there's a very, very small group at the top of that pyramid, a very sharp point, uh, maybe half a dozen or so schools that are admitting roughly one out of 20. So the pyramid is a useful tool in, in helping students and parents and educators understand the relative importance of any set of credentials in the admission process. Students looking at schools near the top of the pyramid are going to find that everything is looked at under a magnifying glass. I mean, it is the, the big things, the little things, and things they hadn't even thought about will make a big difference. The further down the pyramid a student is looking, the less importance is attached to a particular credential uh, than it would be up above because the schools that are more selective are feeling greater pressure to make fine distinctions between 
great candidates. Uh, again, it's a pretty intuitive notion, but I find that it's a useful teaching tool for families in this process. So um, the, um, the selectivity then is, is defined as we look at the enrollment model by the relationship between acceptances and enrollment, uh, I'm sorry, applications. Uh, when, when we know the number of students we're applying and the number of students we're going to be accepted, we know the selectivity of the institution. Of course, there's some uh, different um, uh, nuances attached to this with regard to state universities that will have separate enrollment models for in-state and out-of-state students, for universities in general that might have different colleges uh, of arts and sciences, engineering, business, etc., that will admit students by program. So the, the selectivity may vary within a university according to the actual program or college to which the student is applying. So in this little scenario uh, where we've outlined a, a a fictitious college with 8,000 applications, 2,000 to be admitted, 500 to enroll. The the first question on the minds of many people is, well, uh, you know, you know, if we can only accept 2,000, which which 2,000 do we take? Do we only take the 2,000 good ones? Uh, the reality is that at most schools in the country, most of the students who apply are going to be good. And by most, I don't mean 55, 60 percent. I'm going to put a big number up, like 90 percent. Uh, and sometimes when I, I, I mention this to audiences, they blanch, they say, Peter, that's a big number. Are you sure that 90% of the students who apply are good, even at those top schools? Absolutely. And I think if you have this conversation with your students, one of the things to ask them is, you know, are you going to be applying to colleges and universities where if you're accepted and you enroll, you expect to fail? Well, you're not going to find many people acknowledging they expect to fail. Failure is always a possibility, but it's not an expectation. Herein lies then the reason that we go with 90%. Most of the students applying to most schools self-select themselves into applicant groups where they belong. So we can see then the, the nature of the competition. In this scenario, 7,200 students are good. We can take 2,000. I'd like to share with you another graphic that helps to illustrate the, this competition. Let's take the 7,200 or the 90% and put them on what I call the competitive playing field. Every college in the country has a competitive playing field. It will be that place where the students are who um, are good. And admission offices can organize all of these students in purely academic terms. We know by scores, grades, courses, letters of recommendation, we know who the really good students are and who the, the not so good students are. So at the top of the, the playing field, we have the, the Phi Beta Kappa types, the, the, the dean's list, honor roll, the academic superstars. And of course, we have JGBs here. Uh, it's always interesting when I'm presenting to a student and parent audience, the parents will volunteer, oh, the just got by. So, oh yeah, you know those guys. Well, at any school in the country, 90% of the students who apply will be between those two points. When students are looking at colleges, they need to make sure that they're putting themselves into competition at schools where they're on the playing field. If, you're, if your academic credentials are not on the playing field, you have no hope. Things just aren't going to work out for you. But if they are in the playing field, that's exactly what you get. Hope. Hope. I strongly encourage students to look at schools where their credentials put them in the top half of the playing field academically to have hope. And if they're thinking about schools near the top of the pyramid, I strongly suggest that they're, they're, put, they're making sure that their academic credentials put them in the top quartile of that particular playing field just to have hope. Now, many times students will ask, how do I know uh, where I have hope? How do I know where my credentials fall? There's really no foolproof way of doing this, but I've developed a, a little bit of a, a formula, sort of back of the envelope formula that might be helpful. Um, and, and, and it has to do with testing. I hate tests. I really do. But, but for the moment, tests help students to predict for themselves the likelihood of admission because, frankly, colleges do value tests. So if a student knows her super score and she's visiting a college that she really likes, uh, she's wondering to herself, what are my chances of getting in? She should look at the profile of enrolled students at that school. That profile, as you know, will reveal these, the range of test results for the students um, who just enrolled. She should find out where her super score falls. If she is looking at a school that admits one out of four and her super score is right smack in the middle of the distribution, um, I would suggest, and well, some people think maybe her chances are 50-50, I would suggest a different logic. If she's, if she's looking just like everybody else in that scenario, her chances are one out of four. If her credentials put her in the top quartile of that distribution, her chances become better, maybe one out of two. Bottom quartile, one out of eight. It's not scientifically driven, it's highly intuitive, but it's a good way to help students begin to shape their initial college lists. 
in putting in terms of putting themselves into competition at places where they have a reasonable chance of acceptance. Now I'm going to go through real quickly here and identify four potential candidates on this playing field uh, marked by the X's. And um, the the uh, the student at the top might be somebody who's a, a very talented museum. The, the next X is somebody who comes from a part of the country that's not represented on our campus that often. The third X might be a, a, a championship caliber athlete, and the last X could be that development case, that student who comes from a family who can build our new library. Now, the point I want to make to families in, in presenting this information is that the students marked by the X here have at least three things in common. Number one, they are all good enough to be in play at this institution. Any one of those schools, and you have students like this, they look at institutions, they, they see their credentials on the profile, and they say, I've got game for that school. I, if they give me a chance, I can get in there, which is true. But number two, none of these students is squarely in the top 2,000 students. Remember, in this scenario, we can only admit 2,000. None of these are squarely in the top 2,000. One is, is probably in that group, but not, not going to be one of the top candidates, and the others are, are pretty well out of the top 2,000. So none of them uh, have any sense of certainty going in here. But number three, and this is, I think, really, really important for families to understand, each one of these students marked by the X possesses something that might be valued by the institution. And if you've heard me talk about a good college fit, you know that I talk about that in terms of the best college for a student will be a place that values her, I'm sorry, him or her, for what she has to offer. So that first X might be the student who's interested in the arts and we value the arts and we're trying to develop an arts program. Now it's her day. Um, diversity might be hugely important to us. That could be a, a big deal for that student. Championships. If, if we if we get evidence that the student can put us over the top in a particular sport, we want that student. And of course, that library is long overdue. So again, this is a teaching tool that I've developed to help students understand the nature of the competition and, and how they might be able to emerge from that competition. Going forward, assuming that the student uh, is, is looking at a college that is a good fit, the student is on the playing field somewhere, I want to introduce the, the agenda. These are questions that, that, that are often considered in the backs of the minds of, of the admission officers that they look at the students. When, when they're, they're considering um, uh, who they want to admit, they want students who are bright. Can you do the work? Are you on the playing field? Or more specifically, are you well up on the playing field? The, the further up on that playing field the student might fall, academically, the better. Uh, are you motivated? Do you love to learn? Do you ask questions? Do you push the envelope? Do you make the classroom an interesting place? Are you a high achiever? Are you somebody who has demonstrated already that you know how to get the job done? And th these are important considerations, again, relative to the academic playing field, making sure that students are in play in a good place. Um, my point to students is it's not enough to be bright because the more selective schools want to see how you use what you have. And that's where that high achieving and motivated piece comes into play. A lot of schools are, are looking for more information. For example, they, they want to see evidence of diversity. Um, and in our world, this is code for we want students of different ethnic background, which is really important. However, quite often colleges and universities will define diversity more broadly. And I think this is missed in the general discussion about college access. Um, and and, and I, just a quick background on this, it's, it's the faculty at an institution that quite often gives us this agenda. So it's the faculty that says, Peter, bring us students who come from different backgrounds, who, who, who have seen life through different sets of lenses. So the challenge to the student is through what, through what lens have you seen life? Um, some have seen life through the lens of their ethnicity, and that's very powerful in giving definition to the persons they are. Some have seen it through the lens of their social or economic background, or the lens of their spiritual orientation, or the lens of their geographic or origins. I mean, where you've grown up in the world has influenced the way you've seen the world. And I think this is important for students to understand that, that really each one of them, regardless of who they are or where they are in the world, each one of them has the capacity to bring some element of diversity to a college campus, but they need to know where it lives within them. Interestingly, as I made a presentation not long ago, a mother uh, volunteered. She said, Peter, I'm a college professor. She said, this discussion about diversity is really important to me and my colleagues. Would you remind them, gesturing to the students, that we also value diversity of thought? Well, this is rather interesting. What's diversity of thought? Uh, how do you quantify that? How do you, how do you find that in a candidate? I've come to conclude that diversity of thought is something that is found uniquely in each one of us. It's part of our DNA. And as students apply for college, they need to understand that it's an important part of their opportunity to present themselves in a different way. Finally, 
colleges want to see givers. We want to see students who will contribute special talents, interests, and perspectives to those existing programs within our community, be they theater, dance, athletic programs. We want volunteers. We want presidents. We want poets. We want students who have some special talents to give. So in the presentations I make to students and the things that you should be saying to students is, yes, colleges want to see that you're on the playing field academically, but they want to see more. If, you're, if you have these three things going on, you're somebody who's likely to be a contributor on your campus academically. But at some point, they're going to ask the question, if we admit you, what do we get? So it, it's got to be a balanced perspective with regard to the information you're presenting in this admission process. Now, much as I'd like to suggest that this is it, that this is the basic formula that, that's going to make the biggest difference for students applying to colleges, there's more, especially at, at schools on our pyramid that are going to be admitting, say, 50% or more of their applicants. Um, th there, there are other factors that will often determine who's admitted after the agenda has been considered. These are factors that typically admission officers don't share with families, factors I call the hidden agenda. And first up on the hidden agenda, and I, I suspect these things won't surprise you in these days, but the first up is money. And uh, it's, it's really important for families to know that colleges are now operating as businesses. This is something that's happened over the last 25 to 30 years. Colleges have morphed into businesses. The decision to admit a student or not, to give financial aid or a scholarship to a student or not, is now a calculated business decision. So it's, it's important for families to be very thoughtful, very intentional about how they apply to colleges. There's a worry right now that college costs too much. We can't afford to go. We, we, you know, they're not going to be able to admit us and give us the money they have. That, that's an incorrect assumption. There's a ton of money out there. Financial aid officers have tens of millions of financial aid dollars at their disposal. And I can assure you that the money that they award to students will always go in the greatest denominations to the students they value most. Please remember that best fit uh, notion. The best college will be a place that values the student for what she has to offer. If you're dealing with a student whose family doesn't have a lot of money, they're going to be understandably worried about making this happen. We're going to talk about this a little bit later in the webinar, too, about how to, how to define all the money stuff. But... But right now, they need to understand that, that focusing on places that value them for what they have to offer will increase incrementally, exponentially, actually, the, the potential that they're going to not only be admitted, but receive the assistance that they need. The money's there. Um, and for many families, then, that means managing expectations, putting themselves into the competition at schools where the student will be valued. And the flaw in all of this is that a lot of families will say, well, maybe what we should do is apply to all these top, top of the pyramid schools. And yes, they're hard to get into. And yes, they're very expensive. But the more we apply to, the better our chance of getting into at least one. Flawed logic. Uh, I think that this is where it's important to encourage students to manage a balanced, a balanced list of, of colleges when they decide to apply. Next up is the question mark, demonstrated interest. The real question here on the minds of a lot of admission officers is if we admit this very talented student, what is the likelihood that he will come? Colleges have, have gotten into big data in a big way. Colleges are now able to, to measure the student's likelihood of enrollment um, well before the student even applies for admission. Anytime a student passes through the, uh, uh, the footprint of an institution electronically or physically, the institution knows about this and they're attaching values to all those pass-throughs and they put those values in their algorithms and their algorithms can predict the likelihood that the student will enroll. It's really, really important that students look at this, the whole college process as, as an opportunity to build relationships. Because in the final analysis, the institution is considering them for admission, wants to, wants to consider a young person uh, in whom they have some confidence that the student is ready to invest, invest in the institution. So the student who is somewhat randomly or whimsically applying to colleges here or there just to see if I can get in is probably not going to show up very well in all those algorithms. Um, and, and there's no real formula for how do you demonstrate interest, but I can tell you now, visiting college campuses is huge. Waiting until after you're admitted to visit is not a good idea. Um, I think it's also a good idea to find the people on those campuses who recruit at the high schools that you represent. Those people are going to be the first to review the applications that your students submit and going to be the last to be able to defend those applications. So it's really important for students to understand the nature of relationship building uh, or the importance of relationship building in this process. 
And then finally, testing is part of the hidden agenda. Now, testing is not hidden at all. We've, we've been lamenting the role of testing in this process for a long time, but I, I, I simply want to re remind students that the role of tests in terms of why they've been designed and how they're administered is to help college admission officers make good decisions about whom to admit based on their ability to do the work in the first year. That said, the test is worthless. Colleges do validity studies every year that demonstrate rather clearly that admission officers can make good decisions about whom to admit without test results. What happens then is that SAT, ACT becomes sort of a de facto uh, def uh, definer of intelligence. Look at all the smart kids we have here. See how, see how high their scores are. Colleges, colleges will use the SAT or the ACT as a um, uh, a competitive credential in this process. So kids are going to have to deal with testing. This is a particularly difficult year for students, uh, especially those who are oriented to the SAT because of the transitions in, in the old test to the new test. My strong recommendation is if you've got a student who, who's trying to figure out which test to submit, call the school and find out, you know, what, what their preferences might be. Uh, if the student has had exposure to the ACT, that's a great option. If the student is looking at a school that is test optional, an even better option, especially if the scores the student has in hand uh, are at or below the school's uh, average for admitted students. Uh, submitting a, a lower score than the average when, when a score doesn't have to be submitted is really kind of foolish because uh, it, it doesn't enhance the competitiveness of the applicant at all. So these are, these are agenda items that are, uh, uh, I think, very important for us to keep in mind going forward. Now, I, I want to share with you um, some, some thoughts that, that I would present uh, to your constituents. Uh, now, these are keys to navigating the process as a parent. You're not the parent. You're the guidance counselor. You're the college advisor. You're working with the students and the family. But I, I think that it's important for you to understand the perspective that, that they should take. There are four things I'd like to address. They need to know the process. As good consumers, they need to know what's going on. They need to start now. There's no need to wait. Well, if you've got a sixth grader, you might want to wait a little bit, but, but nonetheless, people ask me, when's a good time to start the process? My observation, when the student seems to be ready. Uh, you know, it's too often parents start the process on their timetable, not the kids. As a result, a great disconnect begins to grow. Parents need to step back and they need to manage expectations. I'd like to go through each of these points and, and elaborate a little bit further uh, uh, about the impact of, of each and in, in, in how this how each pro point can make the process more pro productive. Can't talk today, sorry about that. Productive for the student. So knowing the process and how it's likely to impact the student means that we need to be realistic about the, the reality of the academic record. If you've got a student with a 3.0 GPA, Harvard's not gonna work. And, and I don't care how you twist it or turn it, it's not gonna work. And that doesn't mean the student is incapable of doing good work. It isn't, doesn't mean that the student can't become uh, a, a high achieving student in college, but the student needs to find a place that's gonna make sense, that's going to meet, meet her or him where he is academically and help him to grow. Uh, the family needs to really understand how the testing record is shaping up. And, and for a lot of families, the, the testing is kind of like financial aid. It's a foreign language and they don't really understand what's how it's being used and you know on the, on the surface a lot of people associate test results with intelligence it there shouldn't be such an association but i think it's important for families to to really look realistically at the testing situation and as i suggested earlier understand the options with regard to the act as well as test option uh speaking of test option uh and and score choice uh, these are important strategies that uh, need to be considered. Uh, people sometimes are cynical about the test optional and seeing it as a marketing strategy for colleges. I can tell you, having worked at a test optional school, it opened a world of opportunity for us in terms of students that we wanted to admit, but otherwise wouldn't have admitted because of the test scores. So uh, test option is a very viable option to consider. Um, and then the score choice is, is important too. And, and this is where you need to catch parents at, and the students at the beginning of the, of the college process because they get all excited about registering for a test and of course the test registration form gives them an opportunity to identify four colleges to which the results will be sent and they're all full of themselves and I want to go to XYZ schools and all of a sudden they've given up score choice. So I think it's important to remind families at the outset that the they own the results and the results don't go anywhere unless they provide authorization. 
Um, where will early decision and early action impact choices of admission? Um, I'm very cautious about talking about early decision and early action until the end of the summer. I, I'm concerned that a lot of families come into this process saying things like, we need to find an early decision school. Um, no, you need to find a short list of colleges that make sense to your student, that are good fits. And if at the end of the summer one consistently emerges as an absolute first choice, then go with it. Then, then look at early decision because then early decision can measurably impact the outcome. Early action doesn't change the outcome probability. It simply provides peace of mind. If the student is admitted early action, then the student is going to be subject to a different kind of recruitment from that institution uh, as they're going to want to lure that student in. We need to make sure that we understand cost and affordability factors. Uh, I think this is an important conversation for, for parents to have with kids at the outset. It's, it's unfair to allow a student to go into this process without having given any consideration to cost and affordability. And I mean in real terms. I don't, I don't mean uh, the mom and dad saying, well, you know, it's very expensive and we can't afford to do this. That, that's an uninformed judgment on their part. But I, if, if they know that they have access to $25,000 to, to paying for college, then they need to be talking to the student about either we look at schools that cost 25 or we need to be looking at places where you're going to be recognized for your academic work or other talents in, in scholarships of some sort. But this is an important conversation that needs to take place early in the conversation rather than at the end of the conversation. Athletic recruitment can have play a big role in, in defining how a student is considered in the admission process. That's a whole other webinar to, to be discussed, but, but uh, if you have a student uh, who's being recruited by Division I or even Division II or III, Division III coaches, you know that that, that turns the, the process on its, on its head in many ways itself. And then finally, learning differences need to be considered here as well. It's um, a lot of families deal with learning differences, documented learning differences, and they, um, uh, they, don't deal, they don't know how to deal with them in the admission process. There's a sense of shame, a sense of uh, we don't want to have to go there. Um, my strong advice is that when, when learning differences have been impactful in a student's performance, they need to be at least acknowledged, if not addressed, somewhere in the admission process. Uh, the notion that you know, by, by disclosing this information, we compromise our students' opportunity to be admitted um, is, is kind of a, a backward notion because do you really want your student going to a school that would otherwise discriminate against him because of a learning difference? There are going to be a ton of places out there that will welcome, if not embrace, the student with full understanding of the learning difference, but they, they know how to help that student become everything that he can be. So I think that these are conversations that, that need to be taking place with parents to help them understand uh, how they can, uh, well, really know the process and, and be well informed about the process going forward. So knowing the process, when do we start? We start now with encouragement and support. Uh, and, and, and this is important because moms and dads have been living this dream for a long time. And now they need to step back and, and let the student drive it. And this is a hard part. And we could talk for a long time about this. But, but I think that, that what mom and dad need to do is make themselves available to take kids to colleges, to see as many as possible. And I, I think that visiting as many colleges early on is a good thing because it helps to establish perspective. By the end of the summer, the student should be ready to apply to maybe eight schools. But you might have seen 20 to 30 along the way. When the student has gone through that kind of a process, the student will have a much more confident approach than to the applications. Uh, engage with the college reps. As I suggested earlier, demonstrating interest, establishing relationships is hugely important. So uh, we, we need to make sure that the, uh, as you visit colleges, you're trying to make connections with the, the regional recruiters for your school. Where test preparation is appropriate, get involved. My strong feeling about this is that you only need to do test preparation once. The, the, the premise of, of what's going on in, in test preparation is, is something that, that lives with you. Having to repeat test preparation every time you take a test, in my opinion, is a waste of time. Um, obviously, take the test, or I'm sorry, do the test preparation so that it concludes within two weeks of the time that the test will be taken. I also want to make sure that, that folks understand this. As, as you know, as educators, there are all kinds of test preparation opportunities out there. Some of you offer those, those yourselves, um, and they're different styles. Some of them are online, some of them are in large groups, some of them are in small groups, some of them are in tutorials. 
I think it's really important to coach the student into the best uh, uh, test prep that makes sense for him or for her. Uh, some kids work really well independently online and some kids completely get lost online because they just don't have the discipline. So it's important to, to, to encourage students into test preparation that, that where they'll be able to uh, manage that, that process themselves and, and, and learn what they need to learn. Smart decision making is important. Um, and this is, you know, we all talk to kids about this all the time. You know, the choose well today so that tomorrow can count. But uh, the, the older they get in high school, the more important it is that they are mindful of the impact of their decision making on a daily basis. It's important to collaborate in establishing a timeline of the essential to do's. Uh, when families get started in this process, um, there's going to be some uncertainty about who's supposed to do what. Well, establish the responsibilities early and often. We need to know application deadlines. We need to know requests when what schools are going to require requests or I'm sorry require letters of recommendation um, and, and when is essay preparation going to be involved. If you think about this for kids who are currently rising seniors that all of their homes should have on the refrigerator some sort of an outline that, that lays out the deadlines and also kind of has a plan for uh, essay preparation. When do you want to have the essays done? Well, if you want to have the essays done by September 1st, you're going to start them August 1st, eh, probably move it up a little bit to July 1st or something like that. Uh, realizing that essay writing is a real process, not an event. It's not a matter of dedicating some Saturday afternoon to getting it done. So it's, it's important that, that all this stuff be laid out and understand also that letters of recommendation can be very important in this process. The earlier a student can secure um, a, a real a commitment from a teacher to write a letter of recommendation, the better. So even now at the end of the academic year, students should be talking to teachers to make sure that, that the teachers have them on their radar screen. If the kids wait until September to ask for that letter, you know, you're, you're going to be dealing with teachers who are spent, who are emotionally and intellectually spent having written dozens of letters over the summer. So it's important to, for kids to get this moving sooner than later, and it's something we can coach the kids to do. We can coach their parents to support them with that. We need to investigate financial aid options. Now, um, for families where money isn't a factor, not a big deal. But when money is a factor, at the very least, they can start by checking out the net price calculators. Now, I'm rather cynical about the real impact of net price calculators because, especially at private schools, it's hard to know what's being measured or which methodology they're using. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, but, but it is possible for families to get estimates of expected family contributions. Uh, during the summer, late summer and early fall, uh, the, the seniors uh, should be able to approach financial aid officers at the colleges that interest them, especially if they're thinking about early decision, with, with a, a question about, you know, if, if, if we're admitted here, what's the financial aid going to look like? And if a family can produce their, for the, the students in the coming uh, application year, if the family can produce the 2015 tax return, um, a hard copy for that financial aid office, the financial aid officer can crank out the uh, need analysis inside of five minutes. So it's, it's something that, that I think we need to be encouraging families to do. Don't, don't live in the dark any longer than is necessary with regard to cost and affordability. Um, and there, there are additional questions that, that I think we can prompt families to, to, to use in getting some precision with this estimate of expected family contribution, but nonetheless very important for them to, to check out. Now, speaking of the, the uh, expected family contribution, let's, let's kind of play this out a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to review a quick definition of the expected family contribution. It's a very superficial, but I think it's pretty effective. Uh, you want to know what the EFC will be. We look at the family's income and assets. And notice I say assets, it's not just income. A lot of institutional statements that sound like if you uh, have an income of $60,000 or less, then you're going to be able to come here without any loans. Well, they're not telling all the truth. It's going to be if you have an income and asset picture of $60,000 or less, then the disposition of your financial aid will change. Um, your income might be $60,000, but you might have half a million dollars worth of assets. They will be factored in. Subtract from that the family's cost of living and voila, you've got the expected family contribution. Uh, it, it seems so easy, doesn't it? Well, how do we arrive at these numbers? Um, there are two methodologies that you know well. Uh, one is the FAFSA, one is the College Scholarship Service Profile. The FAFSA is a federal document 
that is designed to determine the student's eligibility for monies that are given out by the federal government. The, the College Scholarship Service Profile is used by private institutions, about 350 of them, to determine the student's eligibility for need-based financial aid at that institution. Now you'll notice the title is, uh, the slide is entitled Differential Need Analysis. At public universities, there's no question. By and large, public universities are going to use the FAFSA as the determinant of need for themselves. However, at the more selective private institutions, the FAFSA information will indeed be present, but the institution will also ask for the College Scholarship Service Profile information. The really tricky part about this is that when the family sub, uh, completes the FAFSA, they immediately get a student aid report an indication of what the expected family contribution will be, and they're very excited. Now we know what we think you know, what we're going to have to pay. When they complete the profile, they don't get any information back at all. And this is complicated by the fact that the need analysis for the two of these can differ by as much as seven to $10,000 per kid. Uh, so go think about this. If you've got a kid who's completed the FAFSA and families looking at a $10,000 EFC and they're, they're, they're pretty encouraged that they can make this work and then a, a college admits the student and, and gives financial aid to meet full need as they will say, uh, but that the expected family contribution is now up to say seventeen or 18000 that's a big difference for a family that could barely afford ten. So this differential need analysis thing is something that has to be sorted out, but we're looking at the FAFSA the federal document, we're looking at the College Scholarship Service Profile, which measures institutional need, and we're also considering net price calculators. This is a bit of a shell game in terms of figuring out, especially at selective private schools, what information is going to be used because at a given school, a financial aid office can use either the FAFSA or the profile to justify financial aid for a given student. So there's not one methodology that will be used consistently across the board. Um, and I, I apologize if this is getting any very technical for you, but I, I, this is the down and the dirty. And, and what I'm hopefully conveying to you here is that this discussion about admitting students and giving financial aid to the students that we value most is something that can be managed very carefully and very strategically by the admission office uh, or the enrollment management group at a particular institution. For example, we will now look at what we call the uh, financial aid matrix. Uh, financial aid matrix is a tool that enrollment managers have that enable them to monitor the um, um, I got ahead of myself with the slide here monitor the uh, uh, enrollment prospects for their class every day now take a look at what we've got here we've got uh, students desirability on the left um, access from high to low and then we have the category of non admits and then we have the students demonstrated need by the way desirability is a very subjective thing some schools will measure desirability by courses grades scores all objective stuff and others will allow other variables to enter into the picture to to uh, define desirability so you can see what each cell will, will produce in terms of information. We can see the number of students in that cell at a given time, the projected yield for that cell, because we know what that yield had been in the past. We can project then the average EFC or the net revenue for that cell. For example, let's suppose in this first cell, the high desirability no needs to, I'm gonna make this up right now, but let's suppose we have 100 kids, a projected yield of 20%, and an institutional cost of $50,000. And at the moment we take that snapshot, we can tell that we have a million dollars of projected revenue for that cell. Oh, and we can also project the test profile, the GPA profile, uh, ethnic profile for that cell as well. This is an amazing tool that enrollment officers have at their disposal that allows them to watch and manage the, the coming together of the class, both qualitatively and financially uh, from day one. Now, Take a look at what, what happens here. When when I was working in, in admission and financial aid at my institution, uh, we had a, an overall yield on offers of admission at 20%. When we first did our, our first matrix, we discovered that the highest yield of all these cells was 65% among the low uh, <clears throat> desirability, high need students. And when you think about it, those were kids uh, for whom we were the reach school, and we were admitting them and giving them a ton of money. Contrast that with the 27% overall yield. 65% were coming in that, that particular group. The lowest yield we had was in the high desirability, no need category, where we got one out of 20. 
Now, I, I was faced with constant questions from my superiors about how we were going to address this situation because we wanted more of those high desirability students. So we engaged in what was called strategic uh, redeployment of financial aid. We decided we didn't need so many of the low desirable students with high need. We didn't eliminate them completely. We cut the group in half and we strategically redeployed the money in the direction of the students we wanted most in the form of preferential packaging, in the form of scholarships and so on. So I, I just want you to get a sense here of uh, how, again, colleges can be very strategic in the way they respond to students in the applicant pool. I'm showing you a matrix right now that has 12 cells for admitted students. Our actual matrix when I was at Franklin and Marshall is 64 cells, and it can have twice that many. Colleges can be really granular in the way they manage the information about the students they're admitting. So we have this information. The next step then is uh, we decide that we want to admit students. How are we going to treat them? Well, the financial aid process is going to allot uh, financial aid in two forms, gift aid and self-help. This is pretty straightforward, and you probably know a lot about this already, but the gift aid will be the scholarships and the grants, the money that doesn't have to be paid back. The self-help will be the, the loans, the student loan, parent loan, and the campus work study. These things come together to comprise a financial aid award. Now, what I want to do is share with you next a graphic that shows how preferential packaging can come into play in dealing with uh, students who have the same need. So, in this graph, you see three colleges um, that are responding to the same student. And, and I'm saying the same student because we're, we're keeping the EFC the same, $15,000. We're keeping the uh, the self-help, which is the campus work study and the guaranteed student loan, we're keeping that the same at $5,000. So there, there's, uh, each of these schools could treat those, those particular variables differently, but for now, let's, let's make that constant. So College A is saying to the student, you know what, we're going to give you a $30,000 grant or scholarship. Aren't we nice? College B is saying, we're going to give you a $20,000 scholarship, and your, your parents can borrow $10,000 on the, the PLUS loan. College C is saying, look at us. Aren't we great? You're going to get a $15,000 scholarship. And they don't mention anything at all about the unmet need of $15,000. That institution is very intentionally gapping the student. By the way, colleges A and B will make the claim that they are meeting the full need of the student even though the composition of that financial aid award is dramatically different. So the point I want to make here is that, that the same student with the same financials applying to multiple schools can get different financial aid awards um, according to how the institution chooses to read the student's expected family contribution. Now, let's take another look at this little graphic. Let's suppose instead of three colleges, we have three students applying to the same college. Three students, each with the same EFC, with the same self-help, three students applying to the same college, and I want you to see how each of those three students at the same college could get dramatically different financial aid awards. Clearly, the student A, or the column A student, is getting the best financial aid. The, college, or the column C student is getting financial aid that theoretically can make it possible for the student to come if she wants to come badly enough, but it's not treating her as a valued, a valued applicant. So this is the nature of preferential packaging. Um, and again, one of the things that concerns me is that the colleges talk about meeting the full and demonstrated need of all students who apply. Those are empty words, frankly, because the institutions get to, to write the rules. They get to decide what need looks like. And um, it's, it's a complete shell game when, it, when, it, when the families look at this. They have no clue about uh, the, the, the nature of, of the, the analysis that's going on behind the scenes. Um, and I've developed some tools independently of this presentation, tools that will help families compare financial aid award letters to see, you know, if you will, see the apples and the apples versus the oranges and the oranges. Um, so preferential packaging. The next step, when we have the student, I talked about earlier getting that early estimate for expected financial aid. And we have the student who has a keen interest in a school and, and really needs to have some clarity about what the real cost is going to be before allowing, let's say, an early decision application. Uh, take the, the, the 2015 tax documents to the school um, and, and ask them for an early estimate. And the financial aid officer will most likely 
hand over a, in, in 10 minutes time, we'll hand back a number say, this is what the, your, your cost is going to be for the first year. Your expected family cost, contribution will be. Families should then say, what methodology did you use to arrive at this EFC? As you can tell from our differential need analysis, the family is now revealing to the financial aid officer that the family knows as much about the, 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 the variables as the financial aid officer does here that uh, they could be using the FAFSA or the profile. Well, the financial aid officer is in sales mode. We'll probably say we've used the FAFSA. Next question is, what methodology will you use when my child is admitted? Now you're really forcing the issue. And at the very least, the family should be able to get um, – <clears throat> excuse me, should be able to get the best case and worst case scenario on the EFC. Then the next question is, what's the total cost of attendance going to be for my students first year? This is huge because you never find in print the total cost. You find room, board, and tuition, but total cost can be another 15 to 20 percent on top of that. So um, now we've gotten the financial aid officer to concede the total cost. We have the best case, worst case scenario. We acknowledge there's a differential between EFC and total cost. The family needs to say, okay, how are you going to help us meet that differential? How are you going to help us meet that need? And they'll, there is going to be a potential for a financial aid officer to provide a template of a financial aid award. This is what the financial aid award will look like. Well, family notices that there's going to be some uh, loan involved there. What are the projected student loan amounts going to be for years two, three, and four? Really important for this information to be drawn out. Um, this is all discoverable information. Colleges are obligated to provide this information, but they will not volunteer. Students, the parents need to ask for that. So again, we're kind of plotting through the uh, get involved with the process and, and make a good plan here. The next step is for families, and this is, the, this is one that's kind of intuitive for you, but you want to get the families to step back. Remind mom and dad this isn't about you. They need to engage the student in reflective conversation, some of you have heard me talk about these questions before. Why do you want to go to college? What do you want to accomplish when you're in college? How do you feel you can best accomplish your goals? You, as you work with kids, you, you, you know that there are a lot of kids who simply don't have a good sense of themselves. They're, they don't have good answers for any of these questions. I think it's imperative for them to start thinking about these things before they even try to apply to college. And then they need to focus on fit. Now, real quickly, I just want to go through with you what fit will look like. Uh, <clears throat> focus on fit means that the best college will provide a program of study that meets the students' needs, will provide a style of instruction consistent with the way the students like to learn, will provide a level of academic rigor commensurate with ability and preparation, will provide a community that feels like home. Now, I'm going to pause on this for a second because we've just identified at least three, maybe four areas of fit that consistently are overlooked, particularly the style of instruction piece. Kids don't recognize that there needs to be a good fit, a, a synergy between themselves and the institution, and, and uh, they, they need to understand how they like to learn before they can even begin to think about which schools are going to make sense for them. Uh, they need to make sure that if they aren't certain of their area of academic study, that they allow themselves to look at places that will embrace them as undecided. The biggest mistake students make is that, that they apply to universities that say, what will your major be now? And they don't know what to put. They don't know how to respond to the question. Uh, so I think that fit is so important here. And then the last element of a good college fit is this. It, the place is going to be one that values the student for what she has to offer. This is huge. And this, this is the underpinning of everything we've talked about so far in terms of the competitive playing field, in terms of uh, securing financial assistance that, that is going to meet need to make it possible for the student to attend. If we begin with the notion that the best college is the place that values the student for what she has to offer, now we win. Now good things start to happen in this process. So we're still stepping back. We focused on fit. The next thing that families need to be reminded, and I know that many of you <laughs> pull your hair out on a daily basis, <clears throat> making, trying to make sure that parents in particular don't try to engineer their students into candidates that will be most appealing to colleges of choice. Colleges are indeed looking for authenticity. Uh, they want the real student. So <clears throat> wherever you can, try to protect the student from that parent that wants to create the next beauty pageant winner, the next author, the next uh, uh, patent winner. Um, the students need to be allowed to be themselves. And sometimes it's hard to watch that happen because they don't know how to do that. But in many cases, it's because we haven't given them the space to figure it out. Um, this, is, this is an important part of the, 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 
the life process, not just the admission process, but helping kids to feel good about who they are and what they have to offer is huge. So, <clears throat> excuse me, managing expectations um, is, is something that I've hinted at before. We need to be realistic in calculating the chances of admission. Uh, because parents have been carrying the expectations of college for a long time, they already have in their minds a, a very, clear, very clear sense of what, what this young person should be able to do. But this is where we have to go back and look at the data and, and where does the, the data fit in the admission process? What are the chances? We need to focus on places where the student will be valued for what she has to offer. Can't, can't say this often enough. We need to arrive at a short list of colleges by the middle of September. Short list. Um, and, and I'm going to propose eight. I think that if, you, if you're conscious of being thoughtful and purposeful in the presentation of information, trying to build relationships with colleges, plenty, eight will be plenty. You, you try to go to 10, 12, 20, 25, and all of a sudden you lose complete control over that <clears throat> personalization of the process, the customization of the process with those schools. I suggest if there are eight, there are no more than three with the chance of admission is less than 30, or I'm sorry, 40%. We want three where the chances of admission are between 40 and 60 percent, and two where chances are greater than 60 percent. This is replacing the traditional reach, target, safety schools. I, I think that labels like those are, are diminishing to the colleges and, and are, are not as significant to the students. Probabilities are more objective and they're easier to wrestle with. <clears throat> Finally, moms and dads, counselors, teachers need to provide a reassurance. We need to remember that the students, I'm sorry, we need to, the students to know that the success as a college applicant is not a determinant of self-worth. Um, the parental love and support is unconditional. And as you know, working with young people, this is probably one of the heaviest burdens they carry is the, the fear that they're going to fail somebody's expectations. So I think we need to, in breeding a, a culture of the of, of positive, healthy college going, um, we need to be focusing on this, this unconditional love and support that is conveyed to the student. Biggest mistakes made in the process, number one, a failure to appreciate the nature of the competition. That's why we started there. If you go in there sort of uh, blithely expecting that everything's going to work out because you're smart, it doesn't. We need to address the inability and unwillingness to manage expectations. You know. It, a lot of families just try to jam that square peg into the round hole and it doesn't work. The lack of intentionality in preparing applications. Kids just sitting down to crank out applications on some Saturday afternoon expecting it'll all come together beautifully. It doesn't. When they, when they crank them out on a Saturday afternoon, they come to me looking like a pile of stuff. Not, not a very well-crafted uh, discussion about who they are as a person. Um, and, and number four, a big mistake is a failure to prove the sincerity of interest in attending the school. A, a ton of students, a very smart, talented, well-achieving students, fail to get in, not because they're not good, but because they, there are still questions about the sincerity of their interest at that particular school. Number five, we need to be attentive to the importance of the senior year. Uh, wherever you can, remind your kids that the selective colleges are watching and waiting to see what they will do when they don't think they have to do anything. Academically, it will be at precisely that point in time in the senior year when they don't think anybody's looking that the final decisions are made. So we want to make sure that they don't put themselves in a position of jeopardy. I'm going to take a deep breath because I think I've gotten to the end of this. Um, Cindy, I think we're ready. Uh, if, if anybody uh, has questions, uh, we've got a little bit of time. We'll see what we can do. Okay, Peter, we sure can, and I'm going to turn on um, my video. I'm going to turn, have you turn yours on? Um, lots of information, and I know you do these as like three-hour workshops, so um, families, counselors, um, community organizations can contact you to set up any kind of workshops, presentations, things of that nature, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, a lot of the programming that I do for students and parents, it comes in the form of the admission game, which is an evening program that many schools will host. Students and parents become the, uh, the admission committee at a fictitious college, and we work through the credentials. I've been doing a lot of workshops this summer on uh, application preparation as well, but uh, my objective is not to get kids into specific schools, but my objective is to help prepare them to compete effectively, to, to give them information that they can make smart decisions for themselves. And I know we have um, a 
a number of questions. We probably won't have time to go through all of them, but I took notes as you were preparing. And I also wanted to let people know that, you know, as you're looking at all those different things that you advocated, and many of us as counselors and administrators have been advocating this message, especially for our parents, but knowing where students are in terms of being, you know, where they fall in the range in the top half or top top quarter, um, knowing if their test's optional, knowing about testing, college affordability, FAFSA versus profile, comparing their app, um, financial aid, knowing if it's gappy. Those are all things that we have in Guided Path so that families, counselors, um, for their students and those that they work with can see which schools are test optional, where do the students fall, um, how competitive are they. That's all the things that we put in our counselor tool. And that's yeah. why we you know, offer these so that people can learn and see how they can use things better for their students. Sure. So, um, so if anybody has any questions about that, they are certainly welcome to contact us and do demonstrations. We're glad to share with them what we've done um, and how that might impact the work that they do with students and families. So, mm -hmm. um, and um, we're going to look at a couple of questions, but before we close, I also want to mention we're going to have another, this is a series of webinars, as I mentioned, and for those of you who are listening, check out our website. Our next webinar I just posted this week is going to be on writing the essays, and it's by Ethan Sawyer. He's the college essay guy. Um, he's from LA, and he writes and talks about works with students on writing their essays, and he's got some special approaches. The University of California now has a whole new system for those of you that have students apply to the UCs. The old essay questions, the old essay process, it's all out the window. It's all gone. Uh, so now they're going, and I'm sure you've heard about this, Peter. They've got eight questions. You pick four, and they're 350 words each. So the students are writing more answers, but they're shorter. So, um, so Ethan's going to talk about that and other short essay questions. Or, and they're not even calling them essays. They call them essay well, the, reality, the reality is they are essays. I mean, the stu student still will be evaluated based on his or, ability, his or her ability to communicate effectively on a particular thought. So it, 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 it's an interesting uh, change in terminology, though. It is. It is, definitely. So um, let's see. So let me go with some of the questions. When do you think students should start visiting colleges? How early? You talked about doing early. Um, I think that they're, they're really, the student who eventually enrolls at a particular college may well have visited that school three times. Mm -hmm. um, the first visit I strongly suggest be what I'll call a window shopping visit. Uh, and it can take place really any time up until the start of the senior year. Um, but it, it, the window shopping visit is a, is a visit that doesn't involve the purchase. It involves becoming a, a acclimated to the place, understanding the culture. Is this, some, is this a place I'd like to know more about? Um, the second visit might take place during the, the fall of the, ac the senior year when the student can stay overnight, visit classes, talk to students, talk to professors, really mm -hmm. immerse him or herself in the, in the culture of the place. And then the last visit would be uh, in, this, in the spring of the senior year when the decisions are being made. But how early? I think, it's a, I think it's a good idea when maybe there's a family vacation and there's some colleges along the way. If you can plan some extra time just to pull over and spend an extra hour you know, taking a tour on that campus. Maybe there's a business trip with mom or dad. You can get out and see some schools as well. Um, but it, the early visit should be casual, relaxed. Um, and, and when I talk with the parents about this, I'm going to say, when, when, you, when you take your kids on these tours, resist the temptation to ask the question, so what do you think? <laughs> realize, realize, I'm, I'm, I'm a full parent in that way, but you know, realize that the kids need to process this information over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they may not know what they think yet until they've, right. they've really had a chance to sleep on and think about it. So if you've got a kid who's, who hasn't, any interest or any clue about it, and, and that student's in eighth grade, you're not, there's no problem. If your student's in 10th grade, no problem, even 11th grade. But if you get to the fall of the senior year and the student still hasn't shown an awful lot of interest, then then you may want to be having some serious questions about, um, you know, is, the, is my student really ready to engage in this process? The big mistake we make as parents is we try to force them into our schedule. 
And sometimes that's not a terribly productive way to go. Right, right, exactly. So do you, um, do you see Ivy League schools giving need-based and need-based aid based on desirability of students? Do they utilize the same, at the top of the pyramid, do they utilize that same desirability aspect that you described? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like. Because th this is scratching a, a surface, a huge surface that also encompasses meeting 100% of need, uh, that encompasses being need blind. Uh, the reality is that those schools have such a vast array of talented candidates, uh, needy and non-needy, they can do whatever they want and they are never audited. They're never, this is, when you think about our industry, ours is one of the largest industries in the world that is unregulated. Yeah, so yeah. we can say any, we're like politicians, we can say anything we want, but there's no fact check about us. So, you know, institution, an Ivy League school, any, a highly selective school, any school that offers differential need analysis is putting itself in the position of being able to attach a different value to an, a student according to how it regards that student in the applicant pool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and and you know, and they have. To, I mean, they have to. It's otherwise, it's just like you said. They're all admissible, so the only other option is to put their names in a hat and draw them out. Because what else are you going to do? And then we we may see that sometime. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, and we call it. It's like one of the things we call them is wild card um, yeah. for that exact reason. Because yeah. you know, it's just really hard, mm -hmm. um, and. How do you define chances of admissions? And this will be our last question because we really are like totally out of time. Yeah. This, and, and, and I'm glad we could sneak this one in. When I was talking about probabilities and hoping that students will find uh, it, no more than two with the probabilities 40% or less and at least two or 60% or greater, et cetera, that's an intuitive notion. Um, it, there's no formula. I don't have a, 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 a any formula mounted on the, the computer anywhere, but, but based on what I know of the schools, and the selectivity of the school, and based on what I know of the student and the student's academic credentials, I can come to a pretty good conclusion about where the student's going to fit in terms of those probabilities. So when when we're talking about those probabilities, I think that, that our audience today needs to take an educated approach to making that assessment. Uh, and I think you have to be very careful to, if you're talking with the family and saying, well, your chances of getting in here are 15% or there are 25%, the caveat always has to be, this is the way I see it, okay? This isn't a hard and fast thing. Um, and, and just to, to provide further background, if a student's applying to Stanford and the student's academic credential is right on profile for Stanford, students' chances are one out of 20 at Stanford because right. that, right. all right, and, and so right. that's, it's a 5%. It's yep. not stretch to say that. If the student is, um, you know, even above, how can you be above profile for a school that admits 0%? Um, but if a student is at the very top of the profile and has some very distinctive hooks, things that draw him or her out, well, yeah. then, then you can project higher chances, maybe 20 25%. If the student's right. applying to an early decision school, um, then you can add another 15 to 20% uh, probability to the early decision chances as well. So, But you have to be very studied about knowing where the student's profile will fit on, on the school's distribution of, of, uh, of scores and grades. And that's why it's important for us as professionals to visit colleges, talk Absolutely. with people, you know, and understand that because that's the value and the expertise that we bring from, you know, all our different areas. Thank you so much. This has just been so enlightening. I um, always enjoy hearing your perspective and, and just your passion for this. And I know it communicates to parents and students. Um, we will have this recorded, as I mentioned at the beginning. So those of you that want to come back and look at it again. Um, we'll also have the slides available so that you can see the pyramid and everything and that's actually already ready um, on SlideShare and we'll be posting that on our web. So look for an email. It'll have links to all of this and please sign up for our upcoming webinars. Um, Ethan Sawyer is going to do one on essays and then we have one scheduled in July, I mean in August, on the SAT and the ACT by Sam uh, Rosenson from Connecticut. So we're going to talk about that again. So Peter, have a great day. Thank you so much.
Thank you for all the great work you're doing as well and for including me in, uh, in, in the, the presentations you're offering. Well, thank you. Everybody have a great day, and I'm going to go work with students on writing, so <laughs> they're going to be waiting for me. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye.